black like me. Black, 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 black like me. You're listening to Black Like Me with Dr. Alex G, a podcast that invites you to experience the world through the perspective of one black man, one conversation, one story, or even one rant at a time. Here's Dr. G. Hey, 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 good people. I want to welcome you back to another exciting episode of Black Like Me with Dr. Alex G. And hey, I tell you each time we drop an episode that I'm loving absolutely loving season eight because I'm having guests, friends, colleagues in the studio and they're putting me on the hot seat and asking me questions about leadership, styles, snafus, regrets, celebrations. And it has really given me an opportunity to reflect on my leadership style, um, what I want to be known for, what I want to course correct, um, and just having a way of looking back and understanding what impact I may have had on the organizations and agencies that I've served and led. And today is no different. I have a special guest, Mr. Henry Sanders, is in the studio. This is not his first time in the studio. He's a colleague that I've known and we've been friends for decades now. Let me just tell you a little bit about him before I bring him to the mic. For nearly 20 years, uh, Mr. Henry Sanders Jr., uh, uh, the CEO and the publisher of uh, Madison 365, has been a force in community development, economic development, entrepreneurship in Madison, Wisconsin. He's worked for the city of Madison then Congresswoman Tammy Baldwin. He joined the Greater Madison Chamber of Commerce. He helped to start up other chambers. He has created leadership development, organizations like Magnet, and has really served in the private and in the governmental sectors in our community and really has done a lot to better the lives of Madison. Um, He's responsible for bringing um, millions of dollars into our community. Which is, which is just fantastic. He served for a while in um, the Obama administration for the Small Business Administration for Region 5, I believe it was, um, just helping to, to use his own personal and vast experience to motivate entrepreneurs of all ethnic and cultural backgrounds and, and how to help bolster our economy by becoming thriving businesses. Um, he grew up on the east side of Madison. I'm not going to hold that against him, not on this, po- not on this podcast. Um, but I'm really glad to have him here. But in this Madison community um, where we live, he's known as an entrepreneur. He's known as a, a as a media leader and really a thought leader uh, across many sectors. And I really appreciate him and his presence here. Mr. Sanders, how are you doing today? Uh, thank you. How are you doing, Mr. Southside? How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing and, good. And for the record. East side, I'm a north sider, so north side, oh, not east side. I mean, there's a difference. Th- is there really a difference? There's a difference. I mean, you south siders would know it because you guys kind of hide out in this like kind of cave over here. But is that what you call a place where black people live? Caves? Oh, see. Now, first of all, it's not all black people over here. First of all, I mean, so see, <laughs> you wouldn't know from the north side. We got black people on the north side. Three. Oh, come on! I bet you, if you look at the demographics on the north side, I bet it's comparable to the. To the South Side, <laughs> and for poverty, not, they, not, they, back, they, not back in the seventies. Oh no, 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 no today, question. Not today. D- today, today. Oh, no, but back, back then, when you were young, yeah, definitely. When was, we were young, I was I was born in seventy three. So I mean, yeah, I, I was getting my start, and I was paving the way for you in seventy three. Oh, here we go. L- uh, listen, here, man, let me ask you a question before before I pass the mic to you. you. All can tell this is going to be contentious as hell. Listen, some of my black guys. Can the pastor say hell? Can the pastor? Yeah, yeah, he did. He just did. Uh, listen, okay. listen. Um, um, <laughs> growing up, this is some of my my black icebreakers. Have you been told by friends growing up that you look like some black celebrity who you are certain you don't look like? Like growing oh, up, people yeah, said for sure. Oh, that happened. That happened to you all too? the time. Who did all they the tell time. you? Who, they tell you Yo, who, like? who the white people said? Black folk. No, There's who the white people say? The white people said Magic uh, Johnson. No, uh, not Magic Johnson. Um, man, what's the brother's name? Uh, what does he do? He was a basketball player. Uh, man, what's the brother's name? He used to play for Georgia Tech. Larry Johnson was one for UNLV. You know, you remember Larry Johnson? Yes. yes. So you get because I used to have I used to have a part in the middle of my head. Uh huh. So people used to say Larry <laughs> Johnson. That was one. Uh, but that was the one that came a lot. Larry Johnson was younger from black from black folks. Okay, for the black white folks. folks said that. White folks. I mean, Denzel. Denzel wasn't there around then, right? You right. know what I mean? So, 
it would have been any type of rapper, uh, some like Run DMC, or you know what I mean, like somebody who you clearly did not clearly, look like, but he was black. You know what I mean? <laughs> but he was black, and something that they could say, "Oh, you look Charles, just Charles Barkley." Charles Barkley. Oh, they was they was they would say that to Char- you. Charles Barkley. Yeah, yeah. I should get like Barkley. I play sports, so people. That's what white people would see me and say sports. And it would start connecting, connecting the dots. Gotcha. And so, yeah. But rappers all the time, like any type of rapper, I don't care who it was. You know, <laughs> Houdini. Who was the rapper? The brother from Houdini. Uh, oh, the one, the one, the big hat. You know yeah, yeah, saying? yeah. You take me back now, kid. But they, but they would tell you that too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hmm. What we, about you? They said who you, who you look like? A uh, Big Daddy Kane. You get Big Daddy Kane. No, no. I didn't really get that growing up. You know, I can't. I, I don't think people told me that, that a lot growing up. I don't think I had one of those. Well, you grew up on the South Side, looks, kind of. Really looks. But yeah, but we're talking about like what our white friends thought about like in the schools. Listen, I got another question for you. When you were growing up, did again? I'm talking about the white community. Were you ever? Were you ever described as being articulate? <laughs> <laughs> Henry, you're very articulate. You're like, well, my dad's an attorney and my mom. So this mom. depends on what age, right? So this depends on what age. I wasn't considered articulate to so maybe. high school? Yeah, probably. No, probably a little after that. Professionally. Sure. Oh, professional. Okay, professional, talk to me. Come on, talk to me about it. But in high school, it was charming. I was charming. Like so Your teachers was, would say that? Oh, yeah. One teacher actually told me, Henry, you, can, you can't get by in life just with charm. Right, so it's like charming. There was the word for articulate, meaning got you. You you can work in all different circles. You're mm-hmm. you operate well in different settings. So you're charming. A different word for articulate. I got older. And then it was oh, you're very articulate, and I'm like okay, what does that mean? Yeah, no, 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 no. That's the good. That's a deeper like conversation. Is that, are you complimenting me? Are you surprised? Did you think I was going to talk like one of the Cosby kids? So I'm it, fat ever like uber dubba dubba. It's, it's, like what were you expecting? Deeper question: What were you expecting? What were you expecting? And did, did you say that to the person who doesn't look like me? Did you say, "Hey, hey, Jim, you're very articulate," or Janet, mm-hmm. you're very articulate, Karen, are you very articulate? Right. No, 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 you know they, no, 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 of course no, not. They of just course. say, "Hey," but they thought it was a Good compliment. Going, buddy. They thought it was a compliment. They, yeah, they meant, they meant it as a compliment. I, I, hope they they, I hope they don't do that today. Oh, oh my gosh, yes, they still do. They oh. still do. They still say. They still tell people that they're that they're articulate. They still want to touch people's hair. Mm. They still want to touch our hair. Um, so no man that is interesting I just wanted to just ask some of those questions because it's just interesting how we have some of these similar cultural experiences um, in life you know um, I recently um, uh, received an award from UW Madison for, for as an as, a, as an alumni and so um, um, someone who I exercise with um, we have finished working out I don't know them real well um, we play you tennis together too. groups you man good. thank you I'm feeling good I'm yeah, feeling good. good I'm trying yeah. to had a scare so I'm trying to trying to live better and he said, "Hey, and he works for UW." He says, "Hey, I um, I saw that you were recognized in one of the you know alumni luminary awards." I said, "Well, thank you." He said, and he works for UW. He saw it in his mail. He said, "So, did you go to school here?" I, said, I was thinking, "Well, that's the way alumni works, right?" Like, it's well, not, maybe that maybe that your honorary. Uh, I don't know. I, 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 that's really interesting because if someone received an alumni award, I would think they were an alumnus. And so I'm still pondering that. You know how it is. We don't we don't want to make something out of everything, but it's just yeah. one of those things that when I got in my car, I said, "Hmm." And then he he doubled down and said, "So wh- what did you study?" And um, I don't know. It's just it's just, it's just very very interesting because it shouldn't be that odd that we do have black alumni and that UW does recognize them. But I just thought that that was a very interesting question. I didn't post anything about it because I don't want people saying, "Hey, well, what if he just meant?" But I, if I saw that someone was recognized. By any institution, as one of their alumni, yeah. I would assume they matriculated from that institution. I'm listening to you, and I'm curious. You so you have not graduated from racism. I hear what you're saying. Like I, I think a lot of people say you're Dr. G now. You travel the world. You're a speaker, <laughs> books, you know, all these different things. People that don't you're say doing. stuff like that. People don't say wouldn't say those things to someone as accomplished as you. You still get those things today in 2023. You still get comments oh like that. Oh my gosh! Oh my yes, yeah. 2023. Yes, I. You know, um, we you know we offer this U.S. Black History course, and one of the st- there's a participant um works works for UW at the time, and I want to try something different. You know, during, during the pandemic, we couldn't go to the barber shop, and so you know I started um trying to, you know trying twists, and so my hair was looking different. And um, and she probably gone through like three or four of the classes, and she said, "Hey, how are you doing?" And, she, and she's a friend, 
And she said, your hair looks so cool. And I saw her hand going up. Like <laughs> she was about to touch my, like you're wincing when I say it. And she, she yanked her hair back down like, oh crap, this is, we learned not to do this, but I could, I could see her hand, like, like your hair looks so cool. And she probably didn't even realize her hand was raising because she was just gonna put her hand up in, in my head. And uh, so yeah, so in, in this day, in this day and time, I'm not calling that a racist act, but it's just, it's just interesting that yeah, some of these things still take place. They still, they still occur. But hey, what to do? This is why we're here. This is why we have place and space to talk about it. And those are things that we look at and that we feel and we, ex- and we experience while still striving to be the best in our fields and doing, doing what we can. So, man, listen, I'm really glad that, that you hear, that you're here being in the interviewer seat is not new for you because you've got a magazine and a newspaper, a broad reach all across the Midwest, man. How many hundreds of thousands of people are, are reading, it, you know, your stuff? Weekly? It depends. You're talking about our blueprint magazine, our master's is five. All of it together. Like, like I've been over together about 1.8 million Depends two million probably with the blueprint. That's man, that's fantastic. Yeah. I'm, so just it's you, you're just representing Madison and our community really well. So man, with that, I'm going to pass over the mic to you so that I can, um, um, you know, is that is that hard for you? No, is that is not, that is that hard for you pass over the mic? No, it's a little hard. It's a little hard. No, it's not a little. It's not a little hard it's because a, don't we, let them lie to you, folks. <laughs> No, because that because the editor still work for me, so I can, I can still get the mic, but I don't have the mic. See, we're in church. He's being honest. <laughs> <laughs> I still control the editing, buddy. I still control the editing. <laughs> so talk it up, this talk it up, buddy. Right, right. He's saying it's your show today. <laughs> right. It's your show. Right. He's like, it's really not your show, Henry, because edit. He's like that his guy. <laughs> I, you know, so I have, I have a question because I'm, you know, you and I go way back, yes, and I do. can't remember when we first met. I, I'm, I'm literally trying to think when we first met. And I really can't recall. I think we had our first heart to heart at Perkins Restaurant. Okay, when you were running for lieutenant, uh, lieutenant governor, governor, and um, and we that's started right. to t- you asked questions and about the black church. That's right, and I, I had a lot of tough questions about the black church. You sure did. And and actually, I remember that you came to my speech where I gave it the a Democratic convention. I still got pictures of us. Yes, when I was looking young, and you were there, and yeah. I was nervous. You invited me, and I wanted to come. And you came, supported me, and I was so nervous and for speaking to all thousands of thousands of people. Yes, and you were there. You prayed with me beforehand, whatever. Mm-hmm. And the, I remember that we did have that conversation at Perkins. So let's actually, this is the really that good was twenty ten. Yes, twenty ten. Yep, yeah, two thousand nine, twenty ten. Wow. Like yeah, yeah. I remember that clearly. And. Okay, so people need to know this first about me. I'm, I'm a man of God. I'm a Jesus geek. I love Jesus. I love God. Uh, I was going through my process of questioning the church. I still have probably more questions about the church now than I did then, but it's different. The, the tone is different mm-hmm. about how can we be relevant today. But at that time, I asked you about the black church. and You said, what's wrong with the black what's church? What's wrong with the black church? What's the leadership doing for the black church? What's the, what are they doing for the community? Why are people not connecting to the church? Uh, what can the church be doing to more to expand in the community to get more people mm-hmm. involved? This has to be in the back to what do for economic development, all these things. Ironically, you have done a lot of stuff we've talked about since then. I, I was already, I was doing it then. Yeah, okay. See, 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 see can But see. do you remember my answer? When you said what's wrong with the black church, you, you said you. Yeah, you did. You said you get involved. Why aren't you going? To, yeah, I yeah, said it's you. It's 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 up and coming bougie black people what? that have outgrown the faith institution, and y'all used to fund King's movement, and y'all stopped coming, and so the the reason why the black church is broke is because y'all broke it. See, now it sounds like a pastor passing the buck a little bit here, <laughs> but but and we have our responsibilities too. But you you took that medicine and you said, man, that's one of the best. Excuse, reason someone's given me to go to church. I love the way you responded to it. It was well, no, it was a really great conversation. I remember this it was, was really it a was. great conversation. But to give you credit, I think all the things people see you doing now, those seeds were planted so long ago in two thousand ten. Sure, sure, sure. I remember us talking in your office when you said, "Hey, Henry." I want you to look back here. What if I had all this property? You saw this property here? And what if I did this? You remember that? Been, oh, yeah. You said, what if I had this building here, Henry? And what if I did that? And I'm thinking about doing this. And, and I'm like, okay. I mean, like, it was, <laughs> and I'm like, that's a big vision. How would you do it? How would you get the property? All this stuff is right. playing out. Oh, Henry, hey, you know what? I really think we need to do for, more for leaders. And how do we do leadership? So I really want to make sure that we're passing on to that. You start this leadership thing. 
right? I've witnessed wow. you say, I'm going to do this. And it might not happen right then, right. Right. But, it, but it played out long term. And so I, I, as someone who's getting older, I really appreciate longevity. Mm-hmm. I'm starting to appreciate mm-hmm. longevity much more, keeping a standard for long term. Uh, and because I know it's not easy keeping a stand of excellence, which you clearly have. Thank you. Of serving um, and serving others, which is definitely not easy. Thank you. But the question I would have for you, as someone who's um, having a gift or burden of vision, right? Great and, description. And you've clearly had a, a, a gift of vision of how things could be and how things should be. Uh, but not necessarily having the resources at the time to know that those things could happen. <laughs> Never. Okay? But I remember you were adamant that you were going to do this. I remember, like, Henry, no. I'm going to build this here, like, this whole thing. And wow. I, it wasn't necessarily as defined as it is now. Right. But it was, it's in the, it's in the universe. Like, this You're is right. definitely. You're absolutely right. How do, you, how do you explain to someone who is a visionary? Because I think there's so many young visionaries out sure. there who get deterred because they don't have the resources. They have the vision, but they don't know how it's going to happen. To stick to it, I mean, like the Black X, like it's, when is it? Like, Center for Black Excellence and Culture. Yeah, we're breaking ground next spring, spring okay. of twenty twenty four. Twenty four. So this conversation we had ten years. Like, I don't know how many long. Oh, ago. almost ten years ago. And it's now it's starting right, to happen. Right. Explain that process to me, because I, to me, I think it's a personal faith. But I don't know how. Like, how would you explain that to someone? Well. It, I believe that faith lives out itself in many spheres. So it happens in this space on Sunday mornings because I'm communicating. I believe in transformation, but it happens in our leadership institute. It happens with the Center for Black Excellence and Culture because we're trying to find a way to to um, to accelerate black wellness. I'm tired of us leading deaths in so many degenerative diseases, and so I'm asking, well, well what do we know about our survival rate? What what we, what's causing us to live, and how do we bring that back into play? And so I see that. My faith leaves the four walls and plays itself out in a lot of practical ways. I think a number of things um, have helped me to under, have helped me to to stay true to vision. Um, um, one is visionaries need to understand that when we do receive a vision, it has no expiration date underneath it or maturation date. Um, you just see a vision, and so I'm ready for it to happen in an hour, a day, a week, a month. I'm rarely waiting for it to happen in a decade or two or three. I think where we lead, where we lose lots of visionaries is that they think that every vision is a sprint mm-hmm. and they haven't trained for the marathon. They don't know how to hydrate. They don't know how to stretch. They don't know how to pace themselves. They don't know how to draft off the work of others. They don't learn how to study the races of those that have succeeded and those who have failed. And so somehow someone got into me uh, at a young age that if you really have a conviction that this vision is supposed to happen, do not let go of it no matter what. And so I realize it's mine to lose, that if I'm trusted um, to be inspired by, the, by a vision, and I do believe that I receive insights and vision for what I do divinely. I, do, I think it's part of my faith, the way it carries out. And so I can't expect the business world to affirm what's been given to me inside my heart. I mean, they can support it. But even if others say, hey, that's not a good idea. Not everyone thought the Center for Black Excellence was a good idea, but they're on my side now and they're funding it. Not everyone thought that that Black History for a New Day was an idea. Now 5,000 white people have gone through it from coast to coast. And so I'm learning to be a champion in my own vision because I don't sit down and get a piece of paper and say, what do I want to do? How do I set my goals? Sometimes I'm out of my own business and I'll see a need and I'll, I'll assess the resources that I have, both financial, personal, experiential, educational, and I try to employ employ them to the best of my ability. Um, so I think sticking to it for the long haul is very important. Another thing that has helped me in my vision is that I try to engage not only the younger, newer, and more inexperienced leaders, and I don't mean inexperienced pejoratively, it's just they just don't have a lot of experience, but I also like to bring the older people to the table who know their way around the block. That's why I enjoy your mom, because she's done stuff. Miss Kirby Mack and Miss Frances Huntley Cooper, Ray Allen, others. These folks have been around here. They've 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 been trendsetters and the first at this and the first at that and the first on this board and on that board. And if you listen to them and lean into them, they still have the wisdom in getting things done, but they also have strategies. They don't have the energy to necessarily lead, but they become great mentors. And so I love the fact that these older folks who were really stars in our community when we were young 
are still around willing to, to mentor folks like me. I think that piece is very important. And the other thing is I have a network of folks. You hear leaders say this, but I, I mean this sincerely. I have a network of folks who I try to invest in their, their faith walk, their economic needs, their housing needs, their social needs, their cultural needs. I try to invest in these folks. So then when I cast vision, people have been inspired by other things that I've done rally around the vision to make it happen. I think visionaries run solo too often and they don't forget that visionaries can't just look for cheerleaders. Sometimes you've got to create them. And if you've invested in people and they begin to believe that what you say can happen because what you have said has happened, those are some of the first people, the early joiners when vision is really unfolding. So I would say that those are the things that help me to, um, to hold to vision. And then after you have the experience of some of these things coming to pass after 20, 30 years, it's not so hard to sit back and wait for them to materialize. But I think we watch, we watch too much television. Um, and I don't mean that, I, I mean it this way. We have all of these um, idol dance contests, cooking contests that people overnight become famous. And it's not a 20, 30 year um, race and pacing. And I think people don't know what to do with their time or with their minds when they have to wait and grow in their, their character um, to be ready for a job. I mean, to put on my pastoral hat for just a minute, one of my favorite stories in the Old Testament is about David when he was anointed by Samuel to become king. Um, he was told that he was going to be the king of Israel when he was a teenager, but he didn't become the king of both kingdoms until he was, until 40 years late, until he was 40. So from teenage years to 40, he heard this message. And sometimes I think our character has to grow into our calling. That we have a calling, but we don't have the character to really finance that, and so we'll get a we'll get a vision or a whiff of what's to come, but we don't have we don't have we don't have the the integrity, the character, the wisdom, the humility to really take that on, and so you're not really waiting for the vision. In some cases, the vision is waiting on you to be ready to carry it, so that you don't crumble under the weight of its of its failure or its success. I love that. The character has to go into the calling. You could say the same for Moses, etc. That's uh that's powerful. Yeah, it was decades before he really lived into what that promise for was. For sure. Um I'm gonna pivot a little bit. Sure, here sure. Because I wanna go back to that conversation about the black church at that time. Mm-hmm. And I think my critique of the church was <laughs> I think, you know, it was so long ago and my I'll tell evolved. you if you were right. I remember it clearly. And I think my critique of the church was, what are you doing? Where are you at? Uh, why are you not getting involved? Why isn't the church not? There's all these issues going on. The church used to be the hub mm-hmm. uh, for all issues dealing with communities of color, it's black folks especially, but they set the tone for communities of color in general. I, that was my belief. Still is my belief, actually. And where is the church? I think that was my critique at the time. Mm-hmm. I, my critique has evolved, and I think that's not my critique anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, but the question I would have for is for you today, being a black pastor today, would be for the black church. The, I used to believe that I think historically the black church was the moral standard for society. Martin Luther King, you name it, like we were the standard, the moral standard. Like the United States would look and say, "Hey." That's the best of us. The black community, they're struggling. Look, they're marching. They're doing it peacefully. They're doing all these things. That is the best of who we should be. And I think the black church led that. And I think there was a black faith that was the key for that. Like, I think people talk about Martin Luther King. They talk about social justice, but they forget about Jesus, the Jesus part of that, right? It was the faith part that we're really just walking out his faith. Do you think the black church today is still the moral standard for society. If you agree with my premise, you might disagree with my premise. I think, I don't think I agree fully with the premise, but I don't know that the white church is either. So no, I don't think that that's even what uh, the black church um, um, desires to be. I, I think um, perhaps that, that, I believe that, yeah, so I'll just pause there and just say, no, I don't think, I don't think that it is the moral compass or barometer do you think it was community. at one point i think that it was a moral conscience okay for the for the for the okay. community that um I, I, you know, I accept america that. you're speaking out against communism but you're not even treating your own black citizens right you're mm-hmm. trying to be this moral voice in the in the in the world market and black people can't even sit at a lunch counter 
in Birmingham. Mm-hmm. And in fact, um, you know, the, the, the Birmingham Chamber of Commerce president was, was really shut down in the early 60s because he was at a business convention in Japan. They found out he was from Birmingham and said, look, you all just bombed black people this week. And he came back and ch- he came back and challenged the legality of, of, of segregation because he still didn't love black, but he loved him some green. So he was willing to tolerate black people so that he could get that international green. Um, but that was just an example of America saw itself as a moral, as a moral voice. And the black church was a reminder to America. No, you're not. No, you're not. No, you're not. So I think we pricked the conscience of those who thought that they were woke and conscious. Okay. I'll accept that. Actually. Okay. I accept that. So today, church leaders like yourself, church leaders like T.D. Jakes, et cetera, you are still doing the church stuff, but you also do outside of certain economic development, things like that, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and how do you connect to that? So if I'm someone looking at outside, looking in at a pastor, I'm skeptical. Say I'm skeptical sure. of the church. Uh, and I'm not saying I believe this. I'm saying sure. the question. I always want to ask people a question. The sure, church. sure. And I'm skeptical. Okay, wait a minute. T.D. Jakes is my pastor. Pastor G is my pastor. These these guys are out here doing economic development stuff, doing leadership training, doing these Center for Black Excellence. Mm-hmm. What does this got to do with faith? What does this got to do with God? What does this got to do with the black community that's hurting and all that stuff? How would you answer that question for what you're doing as a man of God? Because I can, I can connect it. Sure. How would you articulate that people who are skeptical? It depends on how they, who it was that was asking me. If it were, if it were depending on who the black person was who's asking me that, I would say, do you have that question for the white community? And if the white community asked me that, I would say, first of all, who, who's your leader? Who are your leaders? Because you can identify people because you saw Jake's on the front cover of Time magazine. You see him at places. So mm-hmm. are y'all following Joel Osteen? Like, who, who are y'all following? Y'all, y'all, you know, you're following the people out there at Liberty. You know, take me to your leader, white people. Um, you know, who, who, are you all, who are you all following? Um, the other thing I would say is, pastor is my calling, man. It's not my identity. Mm. And so before I studied theology, I studied economics and African-American history. You know, I, you remember, Henry, I mean, I'm 10 years older than you, but like in, there used to be um, uh, comic books. And in the back, they would have these cutout sections so that you could order greeting cards or mm. um, garden seeds for, for, for um, flower gardens. And you'd sell them. So, man, I used to cut it out, fill it out, use pseudonyms so I could get like three or four different sets. And I'd, I'd sell stuff. So as a kid, I was like the little hustler. I, I about to say, you're a hustler. Yeah, like a hustler. man. I was selling um, or delivering buyer's guide and shopper's window. No, shopper's window, buyer's guide. Um, as a kid, I was always entrepreneurial. Um, and so there are days that I, I, I asked, like, God, am, am I a pastoral entrepreneur or am I an entrepreneurial pastor? Because there are days I sit with small business leaders like you and we can connect because I understand overhead and fundraising and the bottom line. But then I can sit down with some of my other peers and we talk about baptismal services, marriages, burials, dedications. How do we help our people to think about economics? And so I can hold the two um, um, intention um, because I because for folks who have not called me, I don't allow them to define my my call. And so what I love about Jake's um, again, I don't agree with anybody absolutely on every on any on, on everything, but. Someone asked Jakes um, years ago, they said, all right, so you're selling these books, you're a pastor of a church. He's like, yes, yes. They said, so um, are you a millionaire? He said, I sold a million books last year. If I'm not a millionaire, I'm a poor businessman. Because this book sells for like, what, 1999. So it's like, if I can't at least make a dollar off each of those million. And that was just so clear because the church is not writing the book. They're not paying him to write the book. He's generating that revenue, just like if he sold firewood or sausage or, or caught fish in his backyard's creek and sold it. I think the fact that he is modeling that people of faith can be and, and black leaders of faith and, and people of color who are leaders of faith can be multidimensional, I think has done a lot for us. And that's really not new. The old pastors used to be morticians Mm -hmm. and they used to be barbers Barbers. because, because Mm -hmm. because we were bivocational Mm -hmm. and honestly, what people don't realize is, and this is just, this is just my, this is just my humble opinion. Jake's is a machine. He's a mogul. Potter's house can't afford Jake's Mm -hmm. not for what his net worth is. And so the fact that he can fund his standard of living outside the church and not make the church bring all this stuff in the fact that he can go take care of himself, 
when he used to sell out of trunks of cars. I mean, I remember hearing him before he was Jake's at a conference down in Oklahoma when nobody knew who he was. He was saying, get ready, get ready, get ready. Mm-hmm. Nobody knew who he was. He was selling books out of his trunk before he moved to Texas. And so I think um, because the church has got to understand the spiritual needs of people, but the church has also got to understand and love the cultural, the community, the economic um, needs of the community. When we see pastoral leaders who can work, create businesses, create industry in the community, and it doesn't conflict with their faith world and they can create jobs, I think it's a good model of how we are relevant because not everyone who comes to our churches come because they've read um, about us online. Some have been touched by our services. Some have listened to my podcast. Um, Others have, um, you know, maybe purchased merchandise. And so I think it's important that we not limit our people of faith because in years past, they were bivocational because the church could not afford to have them be full time. So they were firefighters and all school teachers and all these other kinds of things. So I think cases, I think um, um, Jake's is a unicorn and an anomaly in that he is really, really um, huge. And he's able to inspire other people who are creating businesses and things that we don't even know about that's helping the small business development because he's letting people know that being successful and being spiritual are not mutually exclusive. Yeah, I'm a big Jake's fan. What's the, which leads me to the question next one, though, sure. is your, for your legacy. And when, you're, when you go home and you mm-hmm. go home and people remember you here, mm. are, you, are you remembered as the pastor you remember as entrepreneur, like what? What do you want to be remembered as? As e all the above. I want to be remembered as a servant leader who was not limited by by a sphere or an agency. I I I currently I, I had to I was doing this recently. When I think about the consultants on the center, my Nehemiah staff, my Fountain of Life staff, my podcast staff. I have 50 people who work for my organizations, whose checks I sign, like my name is on. I had to think about that and say, like, these aren't companies I'm managing. These are companies I started. And many of them happened without people knowing that I was a, that I was a pastor and being a pastor didn't open the door for doing that. Being a pastor didn't finance those, those kinds of things. And so I don't want to be um, known for just a pastor any more than I want to be known as just a husband. I want to be known as a father, that I'm a good son to my mother with dementia. I'm a good brother to my sister who's, who's fighting breast cancer, um, that, I'm, that I'm a good networker, I'm a, I'm a consultant, I'm a thought leader, I'm an author. And so I, don't, I, I want to be remembered as someone who served where there was a need and um, who knew how to bring all of their skills and talents to the table um, in order to serve the community better and I would want someone to be able to, to articulate that at my, at my memorial service why support black like me podcast there are very few places where black activists and innovators can listen to and hear someone so aptly and culturally appropriately voice their concerns and dreams and aspirations and fears and illnesses, and cultural commonalities. Equally, there are so few places where concerned non-black thinkers and feelers, readers and watchers, lovers of culture, stalwarts of racial justice and harmony, can go to learn, lean in, and to be a quiet fly on the wall in black spaces, and experience personal, deep personal transformation through listening to honest black people's truth. Black Like Me podcast is that for so many people in this nation and around the world. Now, while your financial support beginning at as little as $2 a month will get you access to pre-released information, updates, conversations, insights, and exclusive events, your support also affords us the opportunity to expand the quality and reach of our excellent programming and thoughtful, and authentic ways to more and more people. And more importantly, white people need to stop trying to get free shit from black people. (laughs) All right, seriously, your financial support is a vote of confidence and it's an enabler of vision and innovation. 
So why not click that link today and join the movement? I want to thank you in advance for your support and your partnership. That's interesting to me because, uh, but my faith undergirds all. My faith has inspired yeah. all of it, but it doesn't. It doesn't limit yeah. me because you want to touch and impact as many people as you can. The whole city doesn't come to my church, so yeah. I get some of them through the podcast, some of them through other places. But I want to be effective in helping people to become agents of change. Yeah, and servant leadership doesn't doesn't do it for me. It doesn't for you. With I think it's everyone. Everyone uses the word servant leadership, but you're more than that. I, I that's just wouldn't. To me, that doesn't fit. The I'm, I'm I'm open, but I, I think to but to a answer bougie the question, servant leader maybe. No, no. But when I when I when I realized I was a servant leader, um, it wasn't a popularized phrase. Like in you know the early part of the 2000s mm -hmm. when I when I started my doctoral program, and it was really about servant leadership development around the world. You know, we went to study servant leaders in South Africa, in 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 China, in in India. We wanted to see what grassroots leadership really look like um that it's 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 cheapened because it means you influence but you want to be humble about it that's not what servant leadership is servant leadership means you are just as effective and committed behind the scenes as you are in front of the scenes that you don't wait for the cameras or the pulpit or the lights that you're in the trenches with with folks people see me now and they think oh it must be nice to be a pastor and have a team and staff but they don't know that I've carried people out of crack houses because their wives have called me and I called up one of the brothers and said, hey, bro man is over there again and we gotta go, we gotta go get him. Um, or doing funerals for babies who were born prematurely and their caskets look like, you know, small like shoe boxes. Um, and, and helping parents make sense or holding their hands or their heads when it doesn't make sense or the, all the things behind the scenes that gives you the moral and spiritual authority when you're in front of the scenes. Those are the things I'm wanting to um, be remembered for. So the title, um, I guess what I want to say is I want to be remembered for the for the full breadth of my work. And I used um, servant leader as a as a placeholder. But I think the the main thing that I wanted to say was I don't want to be limited for just my pastoral work because that's a that's a part of my work, um, but it's not the only part of my work, and it's not necessarily the most effective part of my work. Hmm. Yeah, I get that. I get that. I, I and I'm trying to model that for for other for pastors as well I, because they're trying to be relevant for people who are skeptical. This is why I'm having the conversation with you because mm -hmm. I, I think there is a new generation coming up uh, who is skeptical of the church for some really legit reasons, being skeptical of the church. Uh, and then there's some questions that I think there's just the confusion around churches, whatever. But I think what you do that's unique. Even like, like first you used to do stuff at the colleges, like you really have a, a brand that people know you're a pastor, but you connect outside that world and you know CEOs and that's a very unique model, I think, especially in the Midwest. Down especially, south, especially Midwest. Down south, not as much. Midwest is definitely unique. I think that could be a model for pastors, people of faith to recognize you can do things outside the church wall and still be effective and your faith can lead you to do other things, right? Because mm -hmm. some people think people pastor because they can't do anything else. Not like when you're established like Jake's, but some people just think anybody could get a pulpit and, you know, go online and get an ordination and start. Right, right. But it takes, it. it's it's different when not only that you're comfortable with CEOs, but they're in your home, you're in there, like you actually have a, you actually have a rapport. Right. And unbeknownst to the rest of the community, you're helping them think about their businesses and not just around DEI issues, right. but right. but other ways of prioritizing family and fears and hurts. And so it's all about being relevant. I mean, if we want to use you know the New Testament as an example, what percentage of Jesus' time did he spend inside the synagogue as opposed to out in the fields, right. among the corn, the, the folks, the workers, the people at the well? And so it's it's really not that... that um, novel of a concept if we're looking if we're looking at that for the example of examples of you know looking at that example for um for christian ministries and so um i'm trying to let folks know that you don't have to only bring part of you to your work or to your calling be a whole part of you be the whole part of you but not enough people nurture because they tell you be careful be careful if you make money be careful what is, what's the community going to say be careful be careful mm -hmm. I, i'm laughing i was laughing because 
did you just point back to Jesus as an example of what you said? I mean, how dare sure, you do that? How dare you? How dare you? How dare you do that? Okay, so we've talked about vision. We've talked about how you the church is today. But I think if I'm again, I'm always trying to listen to the listener how they want it. And if I was a listener, I would say, okay. So the guy, I got it. He's guy. He's been blessed, anointed, favored to do this stuff. He's had a lot. His life has been clearly easy. <laughs> oh. like, it, like he's clearly, you know, has a church. He has. He said he has fifty employees. I mean, like he has a good life, right? Like he said, he was writing books, helping leaders nationally, internationally. He was. Like, he knew T D Jakes before he was T D Jakes. Like this guy has it made. I mean, I didn't know him personally. I knew of him. I mean, I knew of his work. Yeah, but you were in the room, like you know, you sure, saw him. Like, sure, you, you know, sure. You were there when he was before he was exactly. the, the man, right? Okay, so you knew him when he was a young, sure. a young pup trying to get up to the game. Okay, but but any leader I know who's of substance and of character, as you mentioned earlier, and has longevity, there's been some pain. That's Mom. come through. There's been some mm-hmm. failures mm-hmm. that's come through that they have had to overcome, that they had to heal from, that they learned from, that they built from. Can you just give us a couple of those examples from you? If you can look back now and say these were the, the, the pains or the failures that I can clearly look at the line and say that because of that, I'm this. If that didn't happen, I wouldn't be home today. Today, if that failure didn't happen, I wouldn't have done this. Like I think people need to hear the pain that built the character. Sure, sure. That's a, that's a great question, Henry. I'll 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 answer it a couple of different ways. One is when this question is asked of leaders, we often talk about um, pain of failed business or business strategies. I'll come to that one sec- um, secondly, but. Leaders have the pressure of having their own personal pains, their life pain, while living in a fishbowl or in front of other folks. So um, I have often talked about my struggles by not being raised by my biological father. My parents were divorced when I was young, um, and he was physically abusive to my mother. He was an alcoholic and spent quite a bit of time in prison. You fast forward, um, people know me for cross-cultural work. But if you look really closer, like even through my social service circles, even my doc, my, my doctoral work, I'm really known for addressing issues of black fatherlessness and issues of leadership development um, and mass incarceration or, or criminal justice work. But all of those things impacted my life. People just think, oh, he's he's black. That's why he's talking about <laughs> these issues. Fatherlessness is huge in the black community. That's why he's talking about it. But. It took me years to realize why I was so interested in mass incarceration because my father was in and out of prison and that in, in part was some of the reason why he wasn't around. He also picked cotton for a living, so did my mom. And so the realities, the harsh realities of sharecropping and legal slavery impacted him and he just saw things that were just cruel and unusual and he took that pain out on my mom and anyone else um, who stood between him and a brown paper bag with a, with a pint of something in it. And so those things have shaped me. And even the fact that I bring light to the fact that slavery wasn't 100 years ago, that my people talk about being the first in your family to go to college. Both your parents have college degrees, so that wasn't the case with you. My mom did beat me by a semester when she came back to school. <laughs> but my parents picked cotton for a living. So it's not even about being the first college graduate or attendee in my, in my, in my family. It's, my folks pick cotton, like legal cotton pickers. And so, my dad li- yeah, the, living through those real things, um, my wife and I lost two babies um, who were live births. And we had to process this and, and do birth certificates and death certificates in the same day and pick out caskets. And um, while still showing up and, and producing and writing and organizing. Um, and so, the, the, but those things made me because it taught me that. Um, Pain can redefine me, but it doesn't define me. So I've already been defined, but I can always be refined um, and even defined. And so I feel like that's the way um, um, personal pain has helped, but it's also shaped my work. Um, So that's how I think that more people need to be asked about, more leaders need to be asked about personal pain and how it played out and how it impacted their work. It also made me sensitive to others who are hurting. 
I could pick up on it. I could sense it. And it made me want to know people's story because I made leadership look good and accessible. But people didn't know I do all of this work in Nehemiah. And then I go up to the hospital from 5 to 11 p.m. with my wife because our baby was in the hospital in, in the um, NICU, the neonatal intensive care unit for 113 days, 116 days. So from Thanksgiving Day till the end of March, every day we were there until they kicked us out at 11 p.m. And I had to still come back and do payroll and write grants and go to United Way and go to meetings and preach and teach. Um, those are things that taught me um, in some ways. I mean, <laughs> now I'm finding I have to unpack some of this, but that some of that teaches you how to compartmentalize. Mm-hmm. You know, how do you focus on work, then tuck that away because then you're a dad for this baby in an incubator. Then at 11 o'clock, you're coming and trying to eat and get your life back together. And then from 830 to whenever you go to the hospital, you're this community advocate. Um, and you're talking to people who didn't necessarily have a baby in the NICU, but they had a son in prison. They had a daughter in a psych ward. They had a grandchild struggling in crack. And I found that my pain was different. But when you hurt, you hurt. And yeah, pain, pain feels the same. Pain is it pain. tied me in in a way that my middle class may not, lifestyle may not have caused me to wonder about, will my child be able to, will she get the bus tickets to get what she needs to get? Does she need meal tickets? Like that wasn't my struggle growing up. It was as a kid, but not as a professional. But the other pain tied me deeply to, to um, the demographic of people that I was serving. And that issues of, the issues of fatherlessness that I talked about opened the door for me to talk to many of the black men who had been in um, the criminal justice system because many of them wrestled with issues around fatherhood. So even though I didn't take the route that they did, I became the Weeblow and um, the the student council member, all those things, because I could articulate my pain being rooted in in fatherhood, Mm -hmm. they brought me into the group and and helped me to understand um, the routes that that could take you on. I think in terms of the organization, um, man, there are probably a number of things that helped me out. We lost a major grant through um, through the county that was three hundred thousand dollars, and this is back in the early two thousands. Mm-hmm. And that's that was that was huge. That was more than half of our budget. We had to let staff go that we had trained, and then those staff members were hired by the organization that competed against us for the grant. <laughs> so they took people we trained and did the work. And man, I was. I was devastated. You might remember a time, Henry, like around around when we met, where I was doing a lot of stuff outside of Madison. Yeah. Because I was running away from home. Mm. Because it was too painful to be here. We did incredible work, but we did not have the the, the, the um, administrative support to write the reports and stuff. They knew we were doing the work. They loved it. Um, the county told us that there's no one, no county, no human service organization that has partnered with a faith-based, non-religious organization doing the kind of work that we were doing. But we just weren't we just weren't up on our on our reports, and so um, I started doing stuff in New York and other places. People were like Alex, hey, where are you? And then when I would have an innovative moment, people would ask me, "Well, what does Mount Zion think about that?" <laughs> this is before Clem came back, before Michael was here. Mm-hmm. Then when they came, they would ask, "Well, what do they think about it?" And so when I would try to be an innovator, they would ask me like, "Like who has verified it? Like who 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 has vetted your idea?" I'm like. I'm a world-class thinker and you all are asking me these kinds of questions. So I was just like, you all can have Madison and his issues. And I started doing other stuff. Man, I'm sitting up in New York advising the, the, the Korean ambassador to Manhattan. He's asked me, I got his phone number. He's taking me through the embassy with my whole family, my mom and my sister, my cousins and them on new year's Eve, showing us around and stuff. He's like, Hey, we found out we're going to be at the same new year's Eve party. Like, hey, I taught you at the party. I mean, and then I come back here, and didn't even know who my council member was. I had never had a conversation with them. So I felt like there were unnecessary barriers here for a city our small, as small as we are. But, you know, I, I got the cell number of the CEO of AOL and we're talking and he's trying to help me to set up my online presence and stuff like this and building sincere friendships. And then I come back to Madison and just blend into obscurity. Mm-hmm. And so I think um, one of... Or you felt you blended in obscurity. No, I felt like I was... In, nobody saw me because I wasn't around. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you're saying this because no one's around. This. So what happened was, um, I didn't I didn't exert myself. I became the kid who knew the answer, but didn't raise his hand in class because the teacher never called on him. So I knew the issues to these things. So I just sat in class like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I went and took my call from my buddy from AOL. This man's calling me from Korea. 
It's Korean brother. He's coming from Korea saying, okay, Alex, this is what you want to do for your for your social media. Do this. Do, don't hire don't hire a news company to do this what you do. But then I would come here and people would say, well, did you did you talk to people who just came to Madison? What do you th- what, have you asked this leader? I was like, you you mean the one who wasn't even here when I was when I was in these trenches? Like I was part of the Ministers Alliance when Reverend J C Wright started the Black Ministers Alliance. Like there's a school named after him. Like I and I was the 20 year old in the group. People talking to me like I like I didn't even belong here. And so I think what I had to do was reinvent myself. And those circles outside of Madison. Those folks tried to influence me to leave Madison. They offered me jobs in Seattle and New York and like turnkey stuff like we'll fund your staff. We'll fund your facility. We will. We got you. All we need you to do is move here. My wife, like, I'm not moving my baby out to these places. But because they couldn't get me to move for money, because I felt that my work in Madison wasn't completed, hadn't been completed yet. They opened doors to funds and foundations and started funding our work. And so I had outside dollars supporting the work of Nehemiah. And so I could challenge funders. I could say things because there was nobody to play with my money because they didn't know my source. And so I could I could stand up in certain meetings. I could challenge United Way. I could say things because wasn't nobody going to mess with my money because you all aren't funding me. And it became a very it, it shifted the power dynamic. It shifted the conversation. And then I wrote Justified Anger which then brought a whole new stream of support that sort of bypassed. And that, that, I mean, if we're going to be really honest, um, Henry, that I wrote this op-ed piece that went viral in, in 2013. This is actually, we're going to be celebrating the, the, um, um, 10th anniversary of that piece that I wrote front page piece for cap times. Um, but what's very interesting is that it gave me immediate access to white power brokers. CEOs were giving me their cards saying, I want to talk to you. But it also allowed me to bypass some of the established black leaders who thought I might be too young <laughs> to ascend. That, you know, that there's a pecking order. Come on, you you know that this is true. I, I could there's tell a, you there's horror, a pecking, story, horror stories. There's a pecking order. So what happened was I'm having access to people in the black community nor the white community open those doors. My pen and paper opened those doors. It opened those doors to begin to talk. And I had people you know, sitting, sitting down with me. I I remember being at the King coalition, you know, at the, you know, at the Capitol Rotondo on King weekend. And I got a tap in the back and I turned around It's gentleman. I didn't know. And he said, um, Hey, Reverend G, my name is Tony Evers. I'm the superintendent of school. He's now our governor. For those of you who are outside Wisconsin, he's our governor. It's like, Hey, I'm the superintendent of schools. I read your piece. I agree with everything that you said. So then I started having access to people that, no one had to broker. And when you have outside funding and then you have access to folks to say what you really think, it opens the door to be very honest and very effective. That's a very long answer to a very good question. But I think what happened was my pain and disappointment of what looked like failure and maybe the shut down, shutting down of Nehemiah caused me to spend time outside of Madison to heal to build relationships with people who did try to get me to move out of Madison, but because they couldn't move me, they said, how do we support you where you are? And then those people began to support the work that we're doing. And that was the real turnaround of what people know about Nehemiah, Justified Anger, the history class. But that came out of a very dark wilderness period. Yeah. So many things you just said there I, I can totally relate to. Can you? Being young and opportunities and our biggest funder is not from Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. So it gives a lot of different freedom. But I want to end on two sure. two questions. If there was a theme song that Ooh. right now that represents who you are in this part of your life, what would that song be? You know what, man, I'm embarrassed that I don't have that. I've got to really I've got to think about that. Okay. That's a great that's a that's a great question. Um, I mean, I don't want to say something flippant like "lose yourself," you know, just so, you know, something that had a, yeah. a beat and an edgy sound. But I have to, I have to really think about that because there's a, yeah, I, I have to think about that so that it's really, it's meaningful. You said, but what describes me right now? Yeah, right now. Yeah, I got I, I, I love my Dusties, so it probably be something out of, you know, '60s or, or '70s. Got it, but but still, I gotta. Man, I gotta really think about that. 
And the last question. Yes. If your life was a book, mm. what would be the book title of it? And then what would be the first two chapters of the book? The titles of the first two chapters of the book. Hmm. And we'll end on that. The title of the book, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind would have something to do with the weightiness of being chosen. Because you get bashed if you live or act as if you're chosen have a certain level of favor because the general community doesn't realize that you're blessed in order to be a blessing. That you're not chosen because you're a leader, you're chosen to build leaders and to lead people to someplace good. Um, and I would talk about the battle of accepting my acceptance. Um, the first two chapters you said, the first one would be a, a whimsical reflection on feeling um, invisible, unseen, or obscure. When you when you grow into a level of popularity, people just sort of assume you were always that person. I wasn't that guy. I was a guy that was talked about, picked on, too black to be white, too white to be black. Um, uh, sometimes sitting by myself or my sister, thank God we got along, sometimes sitting together because we thought we were something. Y'all thought y'all are all that because, I don't know, we, we articulated words a certain way you know we could speak Spanish we could, you know we you know and so um I dumbed down a lot because I didn't want to alienate friends and so I would talk about that obscurity because that has really fueled my work because I understand and I can feel people who are unseen the second chapter would be about um what you do when you've become comfortable in being unseen and the unsung hero and it's time to come to the forefront, how do you lose that old mentality that you needed to becoming comfortable in the darkness, comfortable in obscurity when it's time to be up at bat and you got a bat like you've been to the plate before? That's a huge shift because you've practiced dumbing down so long that you actually believe you're dumb. Mm -hmm. You don't need anybody else to call you it. So the second chapter would, would talk about coming out of that and living into your chosenness because if you don't fully accept or embrace it you're no good to anybody else you're no good to anybody else and so that's a great question set of questions no one's ever asked me that before but I think it would be something um, something like that well thank you for all that you do you're a blessing thank you for you know being called and actually listening to the calling and, and appreciate know, that man not everyone does so many are called and so well, thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank that. you for all you're doing in the community and stay stay bougie. <laughs> God's too. God's too, man. Stay bougie. Uh, but keep walking the walk in faith and keep uh, loving people how you are and serving the community. And, you know, I, being a, I want to, legend's a big word, but I, you've been, you know, sort of like you're getting that legendary status to me, that icon status, that Milt McPike type status in our community. Oh, wow. Um, and keep, you know, with thank you with That's that with, with that gift in that to keep make sure that you keep passing on loving others. So I think mm -hmm. that's important mm -hmm. for you. So thank you for the, uh, let me do this, and I'll pass the mic back to you. Well, Mr. Sanders, I really, I really appreciate that. Um, you know, uh, Mr. McPike was was one of my principals my freshman year of high school at West before he became the head principal at, at East High School, mm -hmm. and I ran track with his son. Jeff, who has who since passed away, but we were the, we the same age. But those are very kind words. Mm -hmm. And um, and I really appreciate that. I want you to know that I'm taking that, um, that I'm taking that to, to heart. You know, it's, it's so interesting, Henry. I think um, the keys to whatever perceived success I have has been caring for people and uh, when no one's looking or no one's around. And then what happens is some of your actions bring a level of popularity and then it makes it harder to get back to what you're doing. Then people want you to talk about stuff, pulling you away from what you did. It's like when you're a great salesperson and they, then they want to make you the district manager and you can't manage, you can sell and you get away from your love because people have discovered that you're a great salesperson. So my big struggle is that I don't get pulled out of the role of doing what I do and training people who can do what I do and train people that work together. So, man, this has been really powerful and I respect you and um, the things that you are building and even the things that you continue um, 
to build. I love the fact that you that you created your online newspaper. Then you said, you know what, I'm going to do I'm going to do a magazine, and you just keep you just keep building. You do your leadership summits so that people don't put you in a box, and I, I appreciate that. Listen, folks, today has been a really exciting conversation, and you're listening in. You're really being a part of family talk, and and you're listening to us reflect upon um, what leadership feels like, what it costs, what it, what what's required. Um, and you know people who need to hear this, irrespective of their ethnic background. And so take a moment to think about where on your social media platform you can share this. Um, where can you write a comment and talk about what this means to you and how important that it is? And how do you listen to it again to make sure that you just think through the issues that we're talking about? That when you think about black leadership or leaders who are black, we discuss so many other things that we've got to wade through and address before we show up at work in a suit or platform in a suit and then go back and wade through those same things back home. And yet we can do it without complaining because we realize that this is our plight and this is what it means to look like us and to be effective in this world. So just think about that. We don't want you to pity us, but just to understand the strength that it takes. The next time you see a leader, an influencer who looks like me, I want you to smile and smile at them because... You have no idea what it took for them to get to where they are, and they still serve in a way um, that would convince you that they have not had any dark or cloudy days. So just keep that in mind. Click the link here, and you can also um, support us on Patreon. We'd love to have supporters. Thank you for the new folks that have been joining in the last couple of weeks. I really appreciate it. And our listener notes will also be a link to Mr. Sanders' um, newspaper so you can find out about the good work that he does at Madison 365 and um, listen lean in and be changed and not just merely entertained by this podcast but be changed by what you're hearing and then help to live out that change in our world our people need to see folks who have been influenced and who believe in change and so if you've been influenced then be an agent of change and make this world better because of what you've heard today and what you've taken in all right special thanks to my whole team but particularly to everyone who listens Everyone who listens, particularly my patrons, thank you so much for your support. Have a great day, and I'm looking forward to being again with you real soon. Black like me. Black, 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 black. Black like me. Wow, I really enjoyed today's conversation, and I know that you did too. You know, with each episode, I challenge my listeners to do a number of things to lean in, to learn, to reflect, to share, to donate, but more importantly, to act on what has inspired you in today's episode. You know, the benefit of being around for eight seasons is that people constantly stop me and tell me how much they love the show and even give me ideas and suggestions about Black Icebreakers. But you know, I I couldn't have pull this off alone. So let me take a moment so that I can acknowledge and thank my crew. Engineers and producers Jeremy and Eli. Also a member of my creative team is Jakeisha. The music was produced by Corey Saffold and Marcus Fleming is on vocals. And of course you are Patreon supporters and all of our listeners. Thank you. To everyone who listens to this podcast and you decide to share it with someone who needs it. To everyone who listens and then reposts it on your own social media accounts. To everyone who hears something that moves them to act differently, act better. And to everyone who leans in to understand black life more honestly. Thank you. Black like me.